You guys, I can't believe it. They were able to restore our podcast. So we use a streaming service in order to do this every week. And for some odd reason, the actual recording was corrupt. So the streaming service went in and they were able to piece it all together and got our podcast back for you. So I wanted to post it for you. Once we get, there's about, uh, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes or so towards the end where um, the audio and visual kind of run over each other. So it sounds like I'm talking over Jordan because I'm like a second ahead of her. Um, so I promise you in real life, that was not what was happening, but you know, I figured it was better to post it the way that it is versus not to give you the information. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. With that said, we are still going to go live on Monday. We're still going to do our live, uh, event on Monday. It'll be episode 51 and technically it's our one year anniversary because when we started this last year, we started it with Jordan coming onto my live feed on BSPN after she had won Tahoe. So this is actually our one year anniversary. So it, I don't know, maybe this is, <laughs> this was kismet, you know what I mean? But super excited, really glad that we were able to restore this for you. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Comment, like, subscribe, um, and put your questions in here because we'll answer them on Monday for you live. So join us live. It's going to be six o'clock Eastern Standard Time, three o'clock Pacific. Um, turn on notifications so that way you know when we're actually live and we'll see you on Monday. Behind the bikini, and we are on episode 50. That's a big number. It is. <laughs> We've almost made, made it. it to a year at this point, you know? It's crazy yeah. when you start thinking about it. You think back to just how quickly everything goes, you know what I mean? Yeah, literally. And with Tahoe <laughs> this weekend, that was the first one. So, yeah, 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 that's right. Because you won that show, and then right after that, you're like, yeah, let's do this more. So, we were like, okay, let's do this more. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny how things happen, you know? Literally. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. How have you been? How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Um, just traveling a lot. So enjoying yeah. the days. Oh, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm, no. I'm already like, I'm already like, oh wait, we got to do the like subscribe thing. So make sure you like comment, subscribe, all the buttons, wherever they are on your platform that you're watching. And today we are going to be just going through some of your questions. So, you know, a lot of times you send in questions through Instagram, but then also they're in our comment section too on the YouTube channel. So I pulled a bunch of those. Um, we'll just kind of go through them one by one based on how much time we have and all that kind of stuff. Every So on my live last night for when I was wrapping up Tampa and previewing next week, everybody was like, so what, what was the end of your podcast? Because we had to cut last week's off so quick because I had to leave so fast. I was like, that oh, was we, the end. That was the end. I was like, we basically finished it. I just, we were just kind of vamping at that point. And I was like, I, I, we, are, we already talked about everything. <laughs> like we didn't, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> so, I forgot but, about that. I know. Yeah, I was like, not? no, when they, when they said it on the live last night, I was like, what are you talking about? What's part two of last week? I was like, what do you mean by part two? Like, well, you had to go so fast. I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> we were done. <laughs> we were done. We were done talking. We were done. <laughs> yep. And anymore. I feel, you know, that's the funny part. Like everything, it feels like that was yesterday, but it was really like a week and a half ago because that was, that was Monday. We did last it last week. Monday. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, a lot yeah. of stuff has happened since then, you know? Like, yeah. so, I mean, you went to Tampa. I had my little mini vacay thing. I got something on my lip that's bothering me. And, uh, but anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so how was, um, how was the weekend at Tampa? It was good. You know, Tampa is always a weekend that's super long nights. So, yeah. but it, it was really, really good. NPC numbers are super low. I think it was 109 hard yeah. Um, yeah. total athletes. So, that was nice. We got out a little bit earlier. Um, I know I told you guys this before, like the year I won it, I got off stage at like 1245. And then the following year it was like midnight. And then mm -hmm. last year, I think it was like 1130. And then this year we got out at like 945. So oh, wow. yeah, wasn't too, too bad, but all the athletes had a great time. Jamie and Greg's uh, true novice athlete won the whole show. She won every overall, won the whole thing and she looked awesome. So shout out to Taylor. Um, and then the Lorraine who came in second place, it was between a one point difference between her is also one of Jamie's athletes. So okay. yeah. super exciting. Yeah. My girls did super well. It was, it was good. It was a great, a great weekend. Awesome. How about you with your uh, vacation? It was good. You know, I had a little bit of FOMO, you know, missed out on Tampa. Yeah. But you know, it, it's funny because you were mentioning the, the numbers being down. I was looking at my photos. So I used to do, I was, every time I go to, to Tampa, I would do a group photo with all my girls. And I'm looking at, the, the years I'm looking at last year versus the year before that versus the year before that and the numbers. And I'm like, Hmm, it's, it's gone down quite a bit. It's gone down quite a bit. So I think I attribute that to a few things. A, I think the economy is a big part of it. I think people yeah. just don't, just don't have a lot of money to, to, to do anything really right now. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, but also I think I attribute it to, um, 
seriousness of competitors, I guess. Like there's no, and, and I don't mean to say, I don't mean this to sound bad, but there's no reason to be doing that showing more versus how it used to be. Like you used to need to do Tampa, like when you want it, like that was a big deal because that show was a, like a precursor going into like your next national show. You know what I mean? Right. But there's just so many good quality judges now at the different shows. It's like, you don't have to go to a Tampa right. in order to get the right feedback. Like they had the Indiana show this past weekend and, and Becky was there and all that kind of stuff too. So you can get great feedback at that show. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to go to a Tampa in order to get the quality feedback anymore. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Tampa pro and, you know, it was, was, or is a very high caliber show. Mm -hmm. I also think too, that the magnitude of the pro show can somehow also warrant or like ward off the NPC athletes. Yes. The NPC show is the NPC show. However, Correct. it is usually just like you're saying in history, wanted to be one of the most competitive shows. Mm -hmm. I will say this year, there wasn't a ton. I mean, the girls yeah. that won the classes looked amazing, but you know, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it is concerning. Um, you know, something that, you know, Sean, you know, we talked about all the time at the body fusion is, you know, something else that I think is contributing to lower numbers with NBC is just, unfortunately, when true novice athletes have a terrible experience, you know, they're hiring yeah. a very cheap coach or they go to a show in the middle of nowhere that doesn't have a really great athlete experience and they're mm -hmm. turned away from the sport. Um, I was actually talking to a, a promoter about this a couple uh, nights ago because I was, you know, saying that we were seeing this on the coaching side and he's also seeing it, you know, from the promoter side as well. And it's sad, you know, and, Absolutely. And they're, they're, we're hearing it on both sides from these true novice athletes. Like, Hey, I did the show. I had a terrible experience with this coach. They didn't know what they were doing. Or I went to the show. It was poorly ran. And if that's the way that, you know, every show is, I don't want to come back. And, you know, we have to do better as professionals in this sport of protecting a true novice athlete and, mm -hmm. you know, continuing to put out education like we are and making sure that we set the standard, you know, and unfortunately, you know, going back to the economy, you know, a lot of people are getting into the sport super young. Like I couldn't afford coaching at 19 yeah. years old, you know, I couldn't afford the caliber of coaching, but how do we then, you know, give them more education on other options versus just running their body into the ground and not truly loving the sport or even just working on their own, you know, when they're that young to be able to come out in a couple of years when they have more muscle, more tissue, more finances to be able to do it the right way. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's concerning, you know, it's, we love this sport and we want to see it thrive. And obviously we know there's a proper way to do it, but we can't reach everyone, but we need to continue to do our best, which is why I love this podcast to continue to put out good quality information and education. So hopefully it gets spread to the masses. Yeah. And I would, I would take that even a step further for the experience aspect, even beyond the true novice competitor, like just. I mean, myself as a pro, one of the reasons why I choose shows is for the experience, you know, like that's why I went to Japan. I didn't, I didn't need to go to Japan, but I went because I, I wanted to experience their shows there. And I'm really glad that I did because it was completely next level across the board. You know, when you put this much time, effort, money, expense, just everything into something, you want to enjoy that day. You know, you want to enjoy that, that show day. You want it to be a good experience for you. And um, I think what happens a lot of times, and this was, it's almost like people go, it, it's just like anything else. People kind of, kind of follow a, a trend, right? So I think a lot of promoters came into the sport in the last few years because they saw the sport getting like COVID. I mean, we, we grew, you know what I mean? Bodybuilding did. So I think a lot of promoters came into the sport thinking, okay, I'm going to grab a show kind of thing, but they didn't really put a lot of effort into actually creating an experience with their show. Right? right. They just, they just put their name on a, on a billboard, you know what I mean? And thought that that was enough and that's not enough. It's just not enough. You know, I, I I'm going to choose shows for my athletes that I know they're going to enjoy going to, right. you know, like right. giving Whitney Weiser some props with Nashville fish. Show. Nashville. I mean, mm -hmm. I go every single year because of the experience for the girls. Right. You know, she does a great job of that and it's yeah. expensive and it's difficult, you know, and I've had conversations with her, like this wasn't last year because last year she was literally about ready to pop. She was pregnant. Yeah. And she was literally about ready to that. have her baby. I but the, that. yeah. The, and the year before that, I remember having this conversation with her and I said, how you doing? And she's like, uh, huge anxiety. She's like, I just, you know, I was up throwing up all, all night last night and stuff. Cause she wants to have a great show. You know, once she the cares. show actually, yeah. Once the show she actually the show. started, yeah. Once the show actually started, she was fine, but she just was so anxious about everything going off. Okay. That she was, she was like, I was throwing up all night, <laughs> you know, like, 
And and I don't think most. I won't say most. I don't see. I don't think a lot of promoters think that way, right? Well, it's funny. I could think of three promoters off the top of my head and not discrediting any other, just the three ones. It was Whitney, uh, Joe Pishula and Chris Mines. I mean, those are the three promoters that I know no matter what show, no matter where they are, them and their team are going to show up um, for the athlete experience. And, and I do too, you know, I was just talking to a consult this morning and she was like, is there, um, is, is there strategy behind picking shows? And I was like, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. What caliber of an athlete are you? What does your shape look like? What kind of experience do you want? And what's your goals? You know, for the woman yeah. that just wants to have fun, well, we're going to go pick a fun show or right. a, a, mm-hmm. a judging panel that we know is going to be to their liking. Um, a first time athlete, I'm not putting them in a Tampa pro. I'm sorry. It's right. just, it's, it's very hard or it has to be a very specific athlete. I say that. And then I had an athlete that wasn't true novice athlete, but she was <laughs> very, very, very diligent, you know, like didn't have like that true novice mentality almost like, you know, did her homework. So it's just, it's hard, but yeah. there is strategy behind that because I'm protecting you. I want you to have fun, you know, mm-hmm. and do well. So there is, there, it, there should be, I guess, strategy yeah. behind picking the show, whether you're a first time athlete or a seasoned pro, there is yeah. strategy behind it. Well, it's the same thing. Like we've talked about this too with, with CCTS. I put my heart and soul into that every single year. You know, I, we know there's been people that come, have come behind me every year trying to do the same thing, but at a much lower level. <laughs> and yeah. it's, ev- it's happened every year since my very first year, people just trying to do the same thing. And it, it, and I hate to say it like this, but it almost like hurts me because I'm like, you really think it's that easy? Like, you, you really think it's that easy to put something like this together? Because it's not. I'm like, and I can guarantee you, I, I don't make a lot of money on that event that I put on every year. It looks amazing. But the reason why it looks amazing is because I invest everything back into it that we, that we earn from it. Literally everything that we earn from it invests back into the next year. So it's like, you know, it's, it's not that easy. I get it. It's not that easy, but I give a shit. I care. It's like I want, love. Yeah, yeah, I want the girls that come to love it. I want the girls to come like, cause the way I look at it is it's like good juju for the rest of the year. It's like you, you can see the kind of effort that we put into this and this is the kind of effort I'm going to give you when you work with me. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's it. That's, that's what I want you to see from that. So I'm okay with, with, you know, break it even <laughs> basically. Cause that's basically what happens. And when you count man hours, I, massively lose on that event for year when you count man hours that I put into it. But yeah. Yeah, it's like, but that for me, again, it sets, it sets me up with the experience for those athletes to know that that's what they're going to get when they work with me, you know? Right. Right. So, I mean, it's, I wish people more, more people gave a shit basically. <laughs> that was, you know, this, this was not supposed to be the way that the, the, the conversation was going to go today, but that, I mean, it's, it's just, this is just, it has to be, it has to be said sometimes too. I, yeah. wish, I wish people just gave a shit more. Yeah, I mean, really. absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Find so, your tribe. Stick with it. Yeah, right. Exactly. So speaking of giving a shit, so this week. <laughs> So, yeah, so I didn't go to Tampa because, again, going back to you got to kind of prioritize things. And, you know, I only had one girl doing it in the NPC and that was it, you know, and she wasn't even a prep client. You know what I mean? So um, I was like, this is silly. There's no reason for me to go there. So I prioritized spending time with my husband instead. So, you know, we went to Virginia Beach and it was really it was it was nice. We didn't do much. You know, we slept, trained, went to the beach like that. That was what Perfect. we did, <laughs> you know, like that was it. So Perfect. it was like, it really was like, I, I checked in today with Jamie and I was like, yeah, actually, I think I got more activity in on vacation than what I typically do. Cause we were at, we, you know, we walked the beach every day and, you know, we hung out at the pool and got some sun and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've got a little bit, I've got a little bit of color, like a little, <laughs> some of this is Not spray so tan ghostly. too. I know yeah. some of this is spray tan too, but you know, it is a little bit of color from the pool. Um, you know, I just kind of hung out. Like we really didn't, we, we actually had planned to go to Kings Dominion, which is a amusement park on Monday. Okay. But on Sunday we switched over. So, um, Virginia beach is about three and a half, four hours, depending on traffic and stuff from where we live. Right. As far as driving <clears throat> Kings Dominion is in Williamsburg, which is about the halfway point. So we decided that Monday we we're going to go to, or Sunday we we're going to Williamsburg and go to Kings Dominion on Monday and then come home. So, um, we drove up on Sunday and, you know, we were stuck in traffic for a little bit. So we were in the car for a couple of hours and, uh, 
when we got there, our room wasn't ready. So we're like, well, let's go to the fitness center and get our workout in and all that kind of stuff. Right. So the first thing I did, popped out of the car, went and changed, went into the fitness center, which the fitness center is a big, huge, well-equipped gym. It's a, it's a resort. So it's like, you know, like country really? club. Yeah, it's a country club. So it was beautiful. I was like, awesome, wonderful. So I got in there, did my warm up, did my my stretching, all that kind of stuff, and went over and started to do the hip hinge squats. And immediately my whole back went, and I was like, oh, oh, the very first rep on my way down. I was I like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, that's not good. So I was like, this is not good. So I put the weight down. It was a bar that I'm not used to, weight that I'm not used to, a pattern that I'm not used to. The actual gym itself was cold. So even though I did my stretching and stuff, I really wasn't warm and I'd been in the car for a couple of hours and I was stiff. Um, so I just didn't, it, it just, it just, everything right there. And I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> so, um, so I put the bar down, went over and formal a little bit. I was like, it still hurt, but it wasn't like, I didn't feel like I was injured. I feel like I strained something. So, yeah. um, so I was like, I'm just going to keep working out. And I, and I think keeping it warm would be a good idea anyway. So, you know, I kept working out and I just dropped all my weights and intensity down just focused on, you know, time and retention and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I was fine. And like, but I said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to push this. So like we were supposed to, again, we were supposed to go to, go to amusement park on Monday the following day. And I was like, yeah, probably not a good idea to be like on roller coasters and shit today. Probably, probably, probably not a good idea. <laughs> so, so we did not do that. Um, so instead we went into Colonial Williamsburg and just walked around. It's like, it's like, um, it's set up with all of the old like houses and stuff like that, that they had back in when our country was first formed. So it's all very historical and everything. So we just walked around. That's and, you know, cool. So it was That's fun. really yeah. cool. Yeah, so it was fun. We had fun. Um, but so we did that instead. So my back is still a little bit messed up now. Like, it's it, it doesn't hurt, like, unless I move a certain way and I can feel it pinch, you know? So um, I'm glad that I took it easy. But I've also been taking, like, ibuprofen all week and just taking things easy all week and stuff like that, too, and not pushing the intensity and all that. So, um, so I'm going to go, actually, as soon as we finish up with this, I'm going to get dry needling done. So hopefully that will help. Um and just kind of put me back in. I was worried about my check-ins this morning. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pose. But actually, my poses are fine. My poses don't hurt at all. It's more It's more like, because it's hard to, like when I'm tilting and twisting, my back's fine. But it's more like when I'm trying to be relaxed, like just mm -hmm. sit normal is when it hurts. So I don't know if I just overextended it or something when I was going into the, into the squat. I don't really know. So Interesting. Yeah. So I it's, have body it's, work today, too. There you go. See, <laughs> we got to do these things. That was actually one of the questions. So oh, this is a good way to transition, actually, because that was one of the questions that came in. Hang on, let me pull it up and I'll read it. And that way we got we got the right thing said. What do you ask for for body work? Yeah. So what besides massage is another body therapy that is useful during training? So, um, you know, we all know, I mean, I talk about going and get, getting body work done all the time with a massage. For me, it's active release therapy is really what it does. So it's not, it's not a relaxing massage at all. Like most of the time I'm in tears, <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of thing. So it's getting in there, opening things up. Um, they do cupping, they do grasped in. Um, all of that kind of stuff. Today will be the first time I've ever done dry needling. So I've never done it before. So I don't have anything to really say on that yet. Um, but for, from what I've heard, the dry needling can get in and just open up anything you've got tight that's in there, relieve pain, um, relieve muscle soreness, all that kind of stuff. So I'm excited about it. I'm hearing it's pretty intense as well. Um, so there's that. But if I can if I can make it through the active therapy, release stuff, I think I'm, I'll be okay with the dry, the dry needling. So um, there's that. I mean, as far as like body work stuff too, it's just the stretching and stuff all the time, you know, yoga all the time, uh, Pilates all the time. I should have grabbed, I got, I just got this little, it's like, it looks like a little triangle, um, thing that I sit on and put and like do my, you know, get into the muscle and all stuff that's release on it too. What's that called? I can't even think what it's called, but anyway, I got one of those things. <laughs> Mine's a thumby. It looks like a thumb and you like go okay. into the wall and you can like get into like your SI joint or like your psoas in the front, like hold yeah. on it. Is that what yeah. you're talking? Yeah. Yes. This is exactly, that's exactly what this is. It's just, it's yeah. a triangle. It looks like, yeah. you remember back in the day you used to have those, those holders that you put on your pencil for when you're like yeah. with your pencil. Yeah. That's what it looks like. It looks like that, but it's hard and you lay on it yeah. and you're in your different areas and stuff like that. So that's what it looks like. <laughs> so there's that foam rolling, yoga wheel, all that. What else? What, what else do you do? Oh God, I have like a whole recovery center in my house. I have a Theragun, um, like the small uh, portable one. That one is super cheap. It's like 165 bucks. It's worth mm -hmm. every single penny. I use it pre-workout. I use it when I'm sore. Um, I just got the Thera cuffs. Um, so they're actually electronic. So you press a button and then it will, it will suck and stick to you. And then there's a like oh. heating and a massage method. So 
we ended up with one and we needed more. So we bought a couple more. I got them on Amazon. Those are super, super cool to do just Mm -hmm. self-recovery. I have the Nordatech boots. I just got those as Mm -hmm. well a few weeks ago. Those are amazing. Like if Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like, especially in prep, you know, that heavy, like lead tight, lower body feeling. Um, It has like actually has a pre-workout setting. I haven't done a pre-workout yet. I've only done it for recovery posts and I love it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have those, but yeah, I'm a huge fan of body work and something that I hear all the time is, well, what's the difference between body work and a massage? So, you know, I could think, you know, kind of what Sean was saying, like to me, like I call it a love massage, you know, when you go to a spa or like somebody's doing a total body massage and you, not to say that deep tissue is not hard and tough but yeah. to me like that's not enough I do I do once a month of a love massage and then every other week of body work um yeah. so body work to me is someone that like truly understands our sport how mm-hmm. we're training um I've had two fantastic body work people one in Tampa and now one out here in Arizona and they work the same way I go in there I pose for them they look and see kind of what's tight what's popping what's not get me on the table start doing some, you know, grass and techniques, cupping, a lot of stretch and relax type work. Um, and most of the sessions I'm, you know, grit and barren on the table and a little nauseous, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're it's definitely difficult. Um, yeah. She gets me off the table, she'll check, she'll put me back down. It is very specific work. Um, so for most people, what I tell them is, you know, if you're looking for a body work person, start at your gym. You know, yeah. because this is body work is not a masseuse. It's the, of course they have a license, but they're very niche and they're specific. So start at your gym, asking around the people or the front desk. Um, a lot of these body work people are located inside of fitness centers. Again, the two that I've used that I've loved, and I'm very particular with body work. When I moved out to Arizona, Kristen, who I work with now, she was my 12th body work person that mm. I found, and now I'm sticking with her. Um, but they're both located in gym. So, you know, you just have to ask around and it takes some time to interview people and find that touch that you like. Um, and I would say just start with everything posterior chain from the top of your neck down to your feet. That's a really great way to start. Um, a lot of people need work in like their psoas and abdominal areas as well. But if like you're not sure, just tell them everything on the posterior chain because that's where for most of us as bikini athletes, we're tight. We're, we're utilizing yeah. in our muscles um, with training and things like that. Yep. And I agree with all of that. Um, you know, I go to Massage Hope. They come to CCTS every year. And the cool thing about going there is they have different therapists. So they all have different specialties. So depending on what you want, what you need done, you can go to different people, right? Like I go to Jason anytime I can because he does the active release therapy and I feel like I get the most out of that. Um, <clears throat> if he's not available, then I go to Moses who does a really good, you know, deep massage. He's pretty good about finding and pinpointing the areas and things like that. Um, between the two of them, that's really, those are the ones that I go to all the time. Cause I feel like they, they do the best, the best work for me. Um, but that's, you know, you talk to other people that go to their practice and they don't go to those people, they go to somebody else, you know what I mean? So, sure. you know, finding the person that, that works best for you is important as well. So, um, it's funny you mentioned those, those Nordic boots. I have them too, but they're the ones that are they're just for the feet. Like I know yours go like all the way up your legs. Mine go up, yeah. my, up my shins and my calves and that's it. They don't go any higher than that. I forgot that I even had those. I've got those packed away. I got to pull them out. So I mean, I have especially those. in prep, that would be great for you because yeah. with the incline walking and the calf tightness and all yeah. the posing, like that area yeah. itself causes me so much issue. And then the kinetic chain, it starts coming up and then my hips start getting tight yep. and it literally just comes from my calves. Yep. cardio and everything comes from your feet up i tell people all the time this is this is even with posing it's like your your poses start from your feet up and then yep. everything else everything else twists around them so if you don't take good care of your feet don't take good care of your calves you know i get i get shin splints you know if i run too much i'll, I'll get shin splints you know stuff like that my calves are tight all the time i do the i do get massage work done on my calves which i fucking hate yeah because it hurts, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate it. What you said about the feet because Kristen just gave to me about six weeks ago. She told me to go get toe spacers. Oh and I was yeah. Like, oh. What, yeah. you know, what is this going to, I've been wearing them religiously at least three hours every night. And I have not had, uh, of course, until yesterday, calf tightness. Mm. And I have, and I literally got calf tightness yesterday. There, there was a bunch of balls in there. I can't wait to go see her, but it's because I didn't do it the last three days. Oh, I, wow. didn't use my, I didn't take them to Tampa. I didn't use my toe spacers. I'm so gonna to, I'm going to have to look into that. They're on Amazon. Literally, if you look up toe spacers, some people sleep with them. Sometimes I fall asleep with them, but I notice in the middle of the night, like it hurts. It starts, yeah. like it's a little, a little too long. So then I'll just rip them off in the middle of the night. But like three hours a day, like I just, you know, then huh. my night, I'm doing dinner, shower, whatever. I walk around the house with them and it's, it's made a huge difference. You know, it's funny because I, <laughs> I hate my feet. That's, that's, 
That's the, the far, first part of this. I hate my feet. I have really long toes. You see my fingers? My toes are just as long. Okay. So <laughs> I have really long toes. Um, and it's just like, it's genetic. Like my, my dad has super long toes and my mom has really a hard time with bunions and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's funny because the last, I don't know, however long I've been staying at home working on my business, I would say the last 10 years or so, right? I don't really wear heels a lot unless I'm at a show or, you know, I'm going to, uh, to, an event or something, something like that. I don't wear heels a lot. I wear sneakers most of the time. So prior to that, my feet were jacked. Like my toes were all twisted and like all this kind of stuff. And I notice even now when I look at my feet in photos, that they look better because <laughs> I haven't been squeezing my feet into to, to heels. Like I haven't been squeezing them in and I'm like, oh, that, now that everyone's going to be looking at your feet. And I will get them anyway. I have never, but I have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at her toes and how long they are. You know how there's just that thing that, that bothers that you about you your body? Yeah, it's me. I get it. Well, because I get yeah, it. My, I get and my, it. my middle toe, like my middle toe that's next to my big toe is longer than my big toe. So I so you're always flicking people time. off with your middle yeah, toe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. That's why I'm so anal about my stage shoes because that toe will go over the edge if they're not the right fit. Oh my God, that drives me nuts. Yeah. So I see that on stage when girls are like, their, it's their terrible. toes are coming out of their shoes. I'm like, it's terrible. Me. No, <laughs> it's, it's something that I, I I watch all the time on myself. I so I see, it on, like it I see it on the, it, it's not that it, it's not that it hurts. It's just annoying. It's annoying more than anything else. And it's so funny because like, this was years ago. I was sitting down with one of the judges, actually Maz. Um, I was sitting down with Maz and I was like, tell me some feedback that you see as a judge that, that drives you crazy, that no judge is going to ever tell a girl is, is a piece of feedback. And he goes, toes hanging over the shoes. <laughs> it's like, he's like, you're never going to get that feet as feedback. He goes, but they're the first thing we see. Like you walk out on stage. The first thing we see is your toes and your shoes. And if your your if your I toes are coming out, should the, tell people that. Absolutely. Like, we say it as coaches and they just think we're, we're being Nick. Absolutely. I'm like that's where my eye goes. <laughs> like I'm not looking at the physique. I'm looking at. Yep. Yep. And if it's distracting, we talk about this all the time. It's, if it's distracting, it's distracting. It's, it's, yeah, right. If it's distracting, it's distracting. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like one of the ones that was terrible about this, and I brought this up on my live feeds, is that Angela Borges, wellness, her yeah. toes, every time she steps on stage, her toes come completely off of her shoes. Every time. I'm like, how do you, how do you even walk like that? <laughs> Like, first of all, how do you even walk like that? Uh, I just think about like, my toes, like, skidding the floor. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh, that would hurt. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So, yeah. so there you go. You guys got a tip today. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure don't let your toes, toes hang out your from your shoes. <laughs> and it's an easy fix. Again, I have really long toes. I have narrow toes, too. You can see my fingers are very long and narrow. My toes are very long and narrow. My feet are very long and narrow. My whole body is very long and narrow. That's just how I'm built, right? So my feet slide out of shoes really easily. So if until I started wearing the Olympians, my toes would always hang out unless I had gel pads inside my shoes. So get gel pads and put those in the, butt, the balls of your feet, and that will keep your feet inside your shoes if you have that issue. And if if they're still sliding out, you got to get a different size. You just got to get right. a different size or a different, yep. different style or whatever to keep your toes in. That's it. <laughs> There's only so much you can do with gel pads. But for me, that would always work. So what's your a, preferred heel? The Olympian 2.0, the ones that um, the ones that I have, the, the ones with the, the, the rhinestones on them are the ones that I use. Okay. I'm the Olympia yeah. 2.0 with this. I think it's called the strappy mule it has the two straps. Yes. That's what I have. That's what I have. Perfect. Yes. But it has the rhinestones in the, in the shoes. Yes. Perfect. I have the ones that are just the mule uh, Olympians as well, with just the one strap. And I do like those as well, but I don't know. I just, these ones just are prettier. I don't know. <laughs> that's all. I, I walk the same in both of them and that's, and the, I really just chose the ones with the rhinestones in them because they're prettier. That's all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I walk the same in both. I pose the same in both. And so that's, that's always number one is how, how you actually perform in them versus what they look like. That's the first Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I tell people like, you know, for the longest time I didn't, I didn't buy the Olympians because they're more expensive. They're worth it. Oh my you God. Know, shoe, shoe fairy in general. Hits. Yeah. Shoe fairy in general. Closet. Yeah, that's that's where it's definitely worth it to spend the money for sure. Yeah, you know, because yeah. again, talking about feet, everything, everything, everything stems from your feet up. Hundred yeah. percent stems from your feet up. So yep. if you can't walk and you can't pose, you don't doesn't know matter. How to walk, you can't exactly. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. So anyway, that was a little tangent. Let's see. Let's find another. Let's find another. Next um, question. 
question. Um, this is a good one. So, how, well, this is kind of in depth. So, how do you control your Garolin and Gremlin? <laughs> I'm laughing at the spelling. Okay. <laughs> I do Gremlin pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reading between the lines. <laughs> yep. I do pretty good, but I have one or two days a month. So basically, she's 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 asking about her hunger hormones, how to how to control those, and things like that. What are your tips on that? Well, I'm assuming if you're not in a contest prep or a reverse dieting phase where you're close to show, then your ghrelin and leptin is getting affected by something else, like maybe your cycle. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you know let's let's say that we're just in a normal off season setting and you know a few days a month you are just absolutely ravenous um you know 99% of the time when i'm looking at someone's my fitness pal it's their food selection um you know you're choosing a lot of foods with you know added sugars or packaged foods what i would call high calorie low volume foods and not really nutrient timing your macros correctly mm -hmm. um so rule of thumb is you know protein and fats are the most satiating. So they are very slow to break down. So if you are absolutely ravenous and you have things in your diet like protein powder and protein bars, of course, those things are delicious and they're easy to consume, but they're not going to keep you full. So I would start with switching out those sources to more animal protein. So you're having volume in your stomach, something for your body to actually work on and digest and keep you full. Um, push most of your fats in your first and your last meal of the evening. You know, your last meal of the night should not be heavy in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates should be higher in the day when you're actually utilizing and needing the energy. Make that last meal of the night something higher in protein and fats. Like mm -hmm. I think, um, Sean, you're going to talk about a yogurt, a yogurt bowl today that you like. I love a yogurt bowl for a last meal of the night. Yogurt with some nut butter in it, a little bit of fruit, you know, mm -hmm. something like that that's going to keep you satisfied mentally, but also satisfied as you go to bed and feel mm -hmm. full. Um, so most of the time that's what it is. And you know what, sometimes, you know, your hormones are just hormones and you're just going to be a bottomless pit. And you're going to be hungry. I was just talking to a friend last night. She just got her cycle and she said that she ate so much yesterday and never felt full. Okay. Some of that being Taco Bell. It is what it is. You <laughs> yeah. know, you just have to find that discipline and know like, am I hungry? Or is this hormones? Right. And just try to keep yourself busy. I know that's easier said than done, but like even prep, like the days that I'm super hungry, I go for a walk. You know, when you're walking and you're sweating and you're moving, you, you kind of stop thinking about food. You know, yep. if you're sitting around the house watching TV and you're getting kind of that boredom, hunger, you got to kind of change that behavior as well. Yep. And just to kind of piggyback on some of the things you said with the food choices when you're talking about protein bars and things like that. <clears throat> they all contain artificial ingredients, sweeteners, things like that. And those, those will ignite more cravings and more hunger as well. So if you're finding that your, maybe your hunger spikes after you eat something like that, it's because those sweeteners are, are igniting that more than anything else. So keeping your, your diet a little bit more bland actually might not be a bad idea because that's not going to make you crave more things. Like if you ever notice people that cut sugar from their diet, the first few days of cutting sugar from their diet are horrendous because you've got those cravings. But once it's out of your system, you don't want it anymore. You know, it's the same thing when it comes to the foods that you're eating during prep, you know, and like that's that's one thing I know for myself. I start to wean myself off of all of those things because I know that my food's getting lower and all that's going to do is it's going to make me want more food. You know, so it, it does it does make a difference as far as, you know, bland foods and things like that. Um, and then going back to what you were saying about you know, timing and things like that. Yes, I do that. I, it, typically for me, I, I end up having quite a bit of fat left over for my last meal. So like last night, my last meal, I had steak because I had, I had enough fat to have steak the night before I had enough fat. So I could have a, a tablespoon of almond butter, you know, so that was, and that was my last meal going to bed, you know, so it just time your time, your meals a little bit differently in that regard. Also, your activity could be why, like you just mentioned, you know, getting up and taking a walk or something like that. But I find that the more cardio you do, the hungrier you get. So, and that's just, just, just happens. So I tell people all the time, like when I'm looking at my, my client check-ins and things like that, I, I pay attention to hunger signals as far as what we're trying to do with their, whatever their, their goal is. And I'm like, you know, if you're, if you're not feeling hungry, 
and you're doing all this cardio, there's something wrong. You know, the fact that you're doing all this cardio, you should be hungry. I mean, th that's part of it. You know what I mean? So those, those things that you're doing with your activity throughout the day can actually spike or decrease your hunger as well. So thinking about those kinds of things, that's a lot of times why when you come off of a prep, you want to slowly back the cardio down because that's going to help you with your hunger signals. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So just be, be aware of that. One thing that I think, you know, going back to the artificial sweeteners, and we'll jump on this too, because I have this question to come in too, that helps me when it comes to getting my water in is my artificial sweeteners. Because people ask me all the time because I have my, my, my sweeteners. So I'm going to go into the sweeteners and stuff that I use now. Putting this in my water actually makes me want more water. <laughs> I don't like plain water. I just don't. That's I'm just that person. I, it's hard for me to drink plain water. So putting um, sweeteners in and things like that do help me. Like when I have this in here, I want to drink more. So I end up drinking two, uh, two gallons of water a day because I've got this. Whereas if I don't have this, it's hard for me to get a gallon in, you know. Um, and I was mentioning, you know, I've have, I have issues with inflammation and IBS and all that kind of stuff. So like, when you look at the ingredients on your sweeteners on the back of this, like the, the main ingredients are as far as your is aspartame. So, yeah, aspartame is your main sweetener in here versus anything that has an OL on it. So this does not bother my stomach because it's aspartame. Right. So this one, I've got, I've got a few of them here that I use. I get this one. If they don't have the orange, I like the orange better than the grape, but they're the same. I just get the orange because I like the orange better. And then I just got new ones yesterday because I wanted to try these ones. And the crushed ones are good too. So they have orange, they have um, lime, lemon, and cherry, I think, or fruit punch, something. So I got a variety pack and these are good too. So I always try them at first to see if my stomach can handle them. And then I order more. Like there's another one out there that, that I actually, the taste is okay, but it messes with my stomach and it's, um, the pig star worst ones. Mm -hmm. So I know some people have mentioned they like that one. I, it's okay. I don't really like, it's a little bit too sweet for me to be honest with you, but it does mess my stomach up. So I, I have them, but I don't use them very often. These ones don't mess my stomach, stomach up at all. Um, so you just have to kind of test them and see what's going to work for you and things like that too. Yeah. So going, going with this too, this was, people were asking me about like, um, you know, food hacks and stuff. You mentioned the yogurt thing. My favorite prep snack is Greek yogurt with sugar-free pudding. So I brought one of the sugar, -free, it's literally just jello sugar-free pudding. And I measure out seven grams. Um, you can do more, you can do less, doesn't matter. I do seven grams because that's just what works for my, for my macros. Um, when you do more, it's going to make the, make the consistency of the yogurt thicker. Personally, this is chocolate, but personally I like the cheesecake variety because it ends up being a cheesecake flavor and a cheesecake texture. So that's like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> I have it at least once a day, if not twice, every single day. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> that's my, that's my treat, you know, and it's very low. Like this one is not, it's not high in fat. You can add, like you say, you can add almond butter or whatever. So it's got no fat in it actually. Um, it's very, very low in carbs um, and high in protein. So I have it with my breakfast um, or I'll have it, you know, late night as a snack. I'll even do it after a workout, you know, whatever, pair it with some, some rice cakes and stuff like that. And you're good to go. So that's one of my favorite, my favorite food hacks right there. It's so simple, literally so simple. And it's perfect. Like, and for me, like I, I don't eat a lot of dairy because I'm basically lactose intolerant, but I can do Greek yogurt. No problem. It actually helps. Greek yogurt helps with the digestion. Um, and there's a, there's this, um, concept of when you have a little bit of the lactase in your system, it actually makes it easier for you when you do end up eating dairy. So like, because I eat the, the Greek yogurt all the time, if I go to have cheese or something like that, I can have a little bit and I'll be okay. It won't really badly affect me versus if I just cut it completely out, I don't have any of that in my system at all. I will be in pain from dairy. So, you know, it's just about doing that microdosing almost, you know, it's, and that's the case with every, every kind of food. I think this is why it's a hard time. You have a hard time when you have really restrictive diets because then when you reintroduce food groups and things like that, that you didn't have before, your body doesn't know how to process it. So, you know, if you have just a little bit of it, you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to process it a little bit better when you have a little bit more, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know for you, you keep your diet very, very simple, like this. Very bland. Yep. Simple. Is there anything that you do that helps you? Like if you have a craving or something like that throughout the, throughout your prep? If I have a craving, then I'll, you know, get it in my macros, you know, but my first meal of the day is oatmeal and chicken. And every meal after that is chicken and rice. Um, my last meal of the night is usually frozen blueberries um, with a little bit of fat-free whipped um, whip cream and mm. uh, nut butter. 
I've switched that recently because I'm traveling literally every weekend. So I'm trying to find a consistent, you know, thing. Um, I can't travel with fruit and frozen blueberries. So I switched to the Nugo uh, bars. It's like okay. a protein bar at night. It's got, it's, it's really great macros. I think it's about like 18 carbs, seven fat, like 12 protein. So it's just the perfect, like last night snack that's the only kind of added sugar i have in my diet right now Mm -hmm. um because that's something i can travel with me and keep things very consistent Mm -hmm. um i'm just a soldier on myself and i i will say this is the best best prep i have ever had and i've just done this out the gate you know the chicken rice oats sticking to very simple clean foods tracking my sodium out the gate and it's really really working for me at this point my cardio is still not higher than 40 minutes two hit sessions a week we just dropped food last week a little bit um, and it's working for me, you know, yeah. but obviously I've had preps where I have had macros and I've been, you know, adding things or, you know, having added sugars up until two weeks per show. And I've had success obviously, but I've never been this lean this fast. Um, so I do, I, I love this approach and I've said on a couple of, uh, podcasts a few, few times ago that, you know, now that I'm doing chicken and rice every meal, the urge to overeat is so much less. Like I don't want 10 more grams of rice. I'm just going right to what I want. When I was doing things like cream of rice every meal or fruit every meal, it's just a lot harder for me to not do five grams here and 10 grams here. And I'm human. Like Mm -hmm. I love food. I am a foodie. I love to eat. Um, so kind of putting that my myself on a leash has really, really helped. Um, I'm also much more satisfied when I eat this way. I and, yeah. and when I've tried to do more fun foods in the past, it tastes very good, but I'm always so hungry after a meal and it spirals me. Um, so this is working for me. So yeah, I don't really have any food hacks or anything like that. I, I'm just boring, just yeah. to rest. <laughs> well, I can kind of, um, again, piggyback on that a little bit because of vacation this weekend. I brought all my food with me, but obviously we ate out as well. So um, something that I mentioned in my stories a couple of times is be a pain in the ass when you're at these, at these restaurants. I mean, uh, one thing that helps me when I'm on a vacation or away is I load my meal with protein, right? So I, I'll typically order a green salad and then get protein on top of it. And I'll ask for double protein, at least, depending on what they have. So I did that all weekend. (laughs) I asked for double protein. So, you know, they gave me two portions of chicken or two portions of of shrimp or whatever it might be. And I have my little, my little scale, my little scale is this big. We've talked about this before. My little scale sticks right into my purse. I pull it out, put it on the table and I weigh out my, my proteins and know exactly what I'm eating, you know? And that way I can stay on my macros and I can still be going out and having a good time and all that kind of stuff. So we went to lunch on Monday and <laughs> I ordered, I ordered the shrimp, the bo- uh, boiled, broiled shrimp. And I got rice and broccoli as a sides. And I said, I wanted it, I wanted it dry. So it comes out and it's just like the whole, the whole trays or the whole plate is covered in butter. And I'm just like, uh, no, <laughs> I was like, uh, I, I asked for this dry. He goes, oh, I thought you just wanted the broccoli dry. I said, no, no, no. I wanted all of it dry. <laughs> all of it. He's like, oh, well, olive oil is okay, right? I was like, no, dry. Like nothing on it by itself. He's like, oh, oh, okay, okay. So we took it all back and they remade it. You know, it's okay to ask for those things, right? I, I had to wait another five minutes, but whatever. You know, I got my I got my food and I was able to eat and it was no big deal and I stuck to my plan, you know? So um, be a pain in the ass, you know? That's it, be a pain in the ass. And then, and be prepared. Like I said, I've always got that little scale on me. So then that way, if I do get stuck, I just pull that out and I weigh it and I can track it and I'm good to go. And then you don't feel like you went off or you don't have to feel like you, you, you have to drop everything and just, you screwed up your day or anything like that, you know, and then you can still be a part of social situations and stuff too. And you're good, you know? So that's, that's for me, the scale in my purse is a big, big hack <laughs> because I can always find something no matter where we go, you can find them. They can, they can make you a salad. They can make you a salad. They can make you a chicken breast. It's, you can figure it out. You know what it's I mean? Not, so, it's not from lack of options. It's that people yeah. get very emotional when they sit down at a restaurant. Yeah. And so, you know, I always, you know, tell athletes, if you're going to be doing a meal like that, look at the menu ahead of time. Yeah. Like a clear headspace, commit to what you're going to order, what you have in your macros. And when you get to the restaurant, don't open up that menu because that's yep. when you start to be like, oh, well, they're doing this. And, it, you know, I want to do just 
stick yep. to your guns and stick with that plan that you have walked into that meal with. And yep. just like Sean said, you know, if your food comes and it is not prepared to your liking or how you asked, you have to give it back. You know, we start to underestimate the amount of fats that oil contains in it. We're like, oh, yeah. oh, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Fats add up very fast, very fast, especially in liquid form. Um, so that's a really, really easy way to go off track quick, even though you did the right thing because you just don't want to like ask for what you need. Right. It's okay yeah. to ask for what you need. You know, we talk about this too. We're in the era where it's not just about bodybuilding anymore. So many people have food allergies and intolerances. Mm -hmm. This is very normal now for right. restaurants to have gluten-free menus, vegan menu options. Like this is normal now. So yeah stick to your guns, ask for what you need. And do, if it comes drenched in butter, you have to give it back. Do not yeah. underestimate the amount of calories that are in that meal. Yeah. That made me laugh too, because the waiter, he was, he was hilarious. He was cracking me up at that restaurant. Cause he brought out, we got peel and eat, peel and eat shrimp. He brought him out and he was like, yeah, there's like 47 grams of protein in this bowl. <laughs> We're like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and then, so then after he came out, after he, after he uh, brought our food out and stuff, he came down, he sat down, started showing us our phones. He's got a friend, he's from Turkey. He's got a friend from Turkey who's a bodybuilder and he showed us all these pictures of his bodybuilder and everything like that. We're like, okay, cool, awesome. Cool. He's all getting into it. <laughs> so where you might think that you're being a, a bother or something like that, they actually just opened up a conversation. You know what I mean? So it was actually kind of funny. He, he literally sat down next to Dan at the table, like on the booth and like <laughs> scroll through his phone. And everything. It just cracked me up. I was like, well, oh, I guess there's three of us here eating today. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> can, can you get my food now? <laughs> I know. Well, we're literally like, so yeah. And then <laughs> yeah, I was like, maybe, well, maybe Sean, Sean, maybe you know him. I was like, no, he's from Turkey. I don't know some freaking bodybuilder in Turkey. <laughs> no. It's funny though when somebody knows one bodybuilder it's like they assume that we all know each other we're like yeah we're small but it's also it's not that small yeah it's right. not that small uh, but it was funny it just made me laugh so but yeah it was you know again where you think you might be being a pain it's that's part of their job that's what they're supposed yeah. to do you know Absolutely. so yeah let's see let's find another p question here uh, interrupting our scheduled programming for just a moment here to introduce our brand new YouTube channel partners, Liquid Sunrays. If you know anything about me, you know that I've used Liquid Sunrays, nothing but Liquid Sunrays, my entire competitive career for 15 years. And we are so excited to welcome them as an official partner of our YouTube channel now. So if you've never checked them out, scan the QR code right here, or I will also put a link for their site down into the description box below. Get over there, check out their products and services, book them for your show, get their DIY stuff, get their competition skin prep. You'll want to use a skin prep even when you're not in competition prep. It's that fantastic. And let them know that I sent you. You can use code QES15. And again, thank you so much for your belief in us and in our products and in our services. We believe in you just as much. So thank you so much for your support, Liquid Sunrays. And again, scan this QR code right here. Go check them out. Let Mama Ray's know the Mama Cutie sent you. So some of these have come off of um, our other podcasts that we've put up. So this is a really long one. Hold on. I kind of want to address this one because we did, but I think we probably um, expand on it a little bit. So I would love to know the time frame if you are a beginner till you have enough muscle for your first show and from there to from them, they're saying pro card, just a general time frame. So they're asking for a general time frame, basically from start to pro card. So what's your, what's your answer on that one? Depends. Yep. <laughs> how, much muscle are you, how much muscle are you starting with? What's your current shape? Yeah. Are we doing this naturally? You know, yep. there's so many factors. I yep. would say on average, naturally two to three years yeah to be one, to to be 100 percent undeniable competitive fighting for a pro card from yes. start to finish yes um with peds maybe you knock a year off um again depending on genetics mm -hmm. and current mm -hmm. shape um, you know, let's say that you were a division one volleyball player, you're coming out of college and you have muscle, but you just have kind of muscle in the wrong areas and you need to kind of diminish and build up. Maybe you have a little bit of a head start 
right? Yep. So it really depends, but I would just have in the back of your mind, two to three years minimum to okay. be super competitive. Now we all know there's the genetic freaks that they show up to their first show and they win the overall and then they show up to their first national show and they win a pro card. And we've been very communicative on there that we're not diminishing anything from those athletes. That's awesome. Great for them. And time and time again. And I, I've heard it this from Alice too, who was in this position, you know, mm -hmm. Alice Rocha who just beat out Ashley K a few weeks ago at Patriots and now is an Olympian. She won her, you know, true novice, won that show, went to junior USC's, won the overall, got her pro card. And she said, I wish I just spent more time at the NPC. I yeah. wish I had like some more losses and some more experience in the NPC. And all of yeah. these girls say that. It's always yeah. feedback. So I would say on average, have two to three years in your, yeah. in your mind. And, that, and I would say that's when you start to be competitive on, on the pro state or national stage towards a pro card. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win a pro card in two, three years. But that's when you're competitive to do it. And when you should be getting up into those first call outs at that point, you know? Yes. So for some people, it takes them years, even getting into the first call out, it takes them years to get pro card from that point. So I know remember, athletes that are competing eight to 10 years right now and still right. fighting for a pro card. That's right. And remember a lot of it comes down to just being in the right place at the right time too. You know, you can be up against people that just are a touch better than you just a little bit over and over and over and over and over again, or you can just break through one day, you know, and just be lucky. And then also taking into account your, like you said, your background, but also your genetic structure. I wanted to use this as, as an example because I know you posted your your um, weight the other day. So you're how tall and how much do you weigh? I'm 5'3", and this morning I was 122. And what do you typically get on, get on stage around? I usually have to deplete to 116, 118, and then I fill right back out to like 120. Okay. Myself, I'm 5'9". I get on stage around 139. That's my, my morning show weight. So usually 20 pounds, stage, 20 pounds, mm -hmm. 20 pounds. So you got to take that into account too. It's easy to see that kind of thing when you're looking at, like, I think when you're looking at like open men bodybuilding, you can see the difference between an open male bodybuilder, like a like 275 guy versus a 212 guy. You can see the difference there. They're two different divisions. You know what I mean? But they're, they're the same, same shape, but two different divisions. You got to remember when you're in bikini or any female division, there is no 212. <laughs> For women, right? We're all on the same stage and I'm 20 pounds heavier. Yeah. So it takes, it takes time to build that kind of mass. It takes time to build that kind of structure and all that kind of stuff too. And then it goes the opposite way. Girls that are shorter than you have their own struggle too, where they put on a little bit of muscle and they look like they've gained 10 pounds, but it's really a pound. You know what I mean? So everybody has, everybody has their thing that they have to work against. So I'm not saying that it's, it's easier for one person or harder for another, but those all go into effect when you're trying to create a certain shape on stage that's competitive towards the yeah. criteria. So you have to remember those kinds of things too. And above peds, you know, something that people really struggle with is training intensity. You know, you get out of it, what you put into it. And I mm -hmm. think, especially as women, you know, my thirst coach, was very good at this. He taught me training intensity. I mean, I remember those sessions. I did personals with him three days a week at my gym. And when I was training with him, the gym cleared out. I was mm. screaming. I was crying. I was literally shown how to push to failure. Mm -hmm. And I was an exercise science graduate. I, I understand, but I, you don't truly understand yourself until you're there. Yeah. Um, and it's very hard for us as women to push ourselves to that intensity, but that mm -hmm. is what is needed to grow. Um, you have to be able to put in that effort. I think social media, a lot of the time clouds the training intensity needed because we all watch our favorite favorite pros and especially the top 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 olympians and they're not training that hard and heavy because they're doing well and they don't really need that much more size mm -hmm. but when you are new to the sport you have to put in training intensity in order to perpetuate muscle hypertrophy and mm -hmm. we're not be able to show that ourselves i yep. encourage girls all the time to go get a trainer even if it's just for a few sessions have the mm -hmm. trainer show you true failure have the trainer show you true form that way you understand out the gate how to train but again you put back you put into it or you get out what you put into it you know mm -hmm. so you're just going to the gym with check box you're work, going like you're going like you know, this while you're doing your reps i see people sitting on the hip thrust going like this and you're like this. That. i'm like yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. You're leaving room yeah. on the table for growth and to mm -hmm. be ready ahead of time. So put in the work now. Yeah. Really make that the the, the funniest part is like I've really started training a lot day. in my backyard and, and stay the, connected the to your back. Our shack. We call it the shack. So the shack attack. <laughs> but anyway, um, I started training there a lot. I go to the I go to the shop when I need like my pit spot and stuff like that. Things I don't have here. Um, so I go to the shop gym about twice a week, and the rest of the time I'm here at my house. And I really like it because it's just me in there, and it's my music blaring as loud as I want to blare it. And there's nobody like bothering me. There's nobody, you know. There's I don't have to worry about smacking into anybody or whatever. I was I was hating going to Planet Fitness. I really was. I was hating going to Planet Fitness. So I've never been the type that really enjoyed working out at home. But this is a different setup. It's not really home. It's our shack. So it's there for training. That's what it's there for. You know what I mean? So it's like I still cut off the rest of my home life to go into the gym, right? And so that, I don't know, for me, it's made a big difference in just the last last few months. I've been down there doing that most most of the time. And I don't waste time driving to the gym too. So that's helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Training, training environment is everything. You know, I, I just had an in-person check-in with one of my girls in Tampa who wasn't competing. She just lived in Tampa. Yeah. And I was honest with her. We've been working together for about six months. And I'm like, hey, we're we're not growing. Like, what, what's going on? And she was like, you know, we were going through everything. And mm -hmm. we come to find out she's training at a crunch fitness. And she goes at about yes. 7 o'clock at night. And we know what a crunch fitness looks like at 7 o'clock at night. It's everyone is in there. And everybody's fighting for machines. And she's literally on fight or yeah. flight mode. She's in the middle of bicep curls. And she sees the, the machine yes. she's next. And she's wondering if she needs to yep. switch the machine to grab it. And I was like, you have to yeah, get out of that gym. Yes, you're going in and training, but you're not training. You are not training. So we 100%. looked at some gyms and she's going to be doing some interviews mm -hmm. with gyms this week, but that is everything. Your training environment is huge to how yep. successful you are. And she, she admitted it. She's like, I am constantly distracted yep. and fight or flight mode that yeah. I cannot be in the session. I'm just checkboxing it. And I was like, thank you for being honest. Now this is something that mm -hmm. we can work on. Um, so if you're, you're feeling that, I get it. You know, and that's where as when you commit to bodybuilding, you might need to pay a little bit more of a gym membership to mm -hmm. get one of those private facilities. That way you can truly work on your craft. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to accomplish what we need to accomplish in a crunch and in a planet fitness because of yeah. how many people are there. It doesn't truly allow you to really settle into the session. So if that's you, go, you know, spend 30 more dollars and go find mm -hmm. one of those niche gyms. You're going to feel like I said, like, so I, I, I won't go back to Planet Fitness. I, I mean, I just won't. I've still got the, got the membership so that way when I travel, I can use it. But <laughs> other than that, I'm not going to go back, you know? So, um, yeah. Hey, this was a good right. one. Says, you both mentioned core control in a few previous yeah. videos and something I struggle with. I'd love to hear your tips, tricks, hacks to improve. So do you have anything specific that you do that's like a core control hack for you? For me personally, I've been very blessed. Um, I, I have a very tight core. Mm -hmm. I attribute that to um, my digestion, you know, so keeping foods under control. Um, I do, I wear a weight belt every single session, whether it's upper body, whether it's lower body, whether it's compound movements or accessory movements from the start to the finish of my workout, I wear a weight belt. Um, mm -hmm. For most people that struggle with core control, we're working on vacuum work and pelvic floor therapy. Um, I have a, a physical therapist that works online with all of my athletes that have trouble with core control. She does an online assessment with them and gives mm -hmm. them a pelvic floor routine to do. Um, Sarah Gallup, who you, uh, my first pro that uh, turned pro at Universe, she was working with Dr. Maria yeah. for a year. When I got Sarah, she couldn't, she couldn't, she had a bubble in her stomach. She could not literally draw her belly button into her spine. Um, the, the, um, key to this is consistency. You know, a lot of the time people are like, yeah, vacuums are on my plan. Yeah. I'm like, but how much are you doing your vacuums? Like, are you truly doing them every day? Um, and mm -hmm. that's what I say, you know, tell my clients that I send to Maria, like, don't do this if you're not willing to do it every single day, because it's going to be a waste yeah. of your money. It is some, it, it, it's a muscle just like everything else. And it has to be trained. Um, so those are mo mostly the things. So pelvic floor therapy and vacuums, keeping your digestion in check. Oh, I agree with all of those things all week more during um, uh, training sessions. Everyday movement. Like even when we're just sitting here talking on this podcast, holding your tummy tight while you're doing this, sitting with good posture. How many people sit like this all day long, 
right? All the time. We see people, we see people over their desk like this, driving like this, yep. all this kind of stuff. You're not, you're not activating anything. Mm-hmm. You're not activating your core at all. Hold it tight. Hold it tight during your entire training. The anterior pelvic tilt. We talk about this all the time with our posing. We got to get that tilt going, but that ruins your core control and every other, every other exercise that you're doing, making sure that you keep your core tight while you're training. I see that happen all the time. Nobody holds it tight. And again, this goes back to um, Instagram training too. You see the girls sticking their butt out during the videos and all the kind of stuff to look good for videos, but that's not how you're supposed to actually train. <laughs> I remember. <sighs> nope. That's right. And it's the you're funny part is when train I was doing the first few videos that I sent pose. to Drew when he changed my training around, I was like, this looks terrible. But I'm like, well, hopefully I'm doing it right. <laughs> I was like, it's not cute at all. <laughs> I'm like, you're not supposed this, to look cute when you're like, my, my ass is terrible, under, but, you know, but I feel it. <laughs> yep. So, no, it's if, if you're, if your training looks good for Instagram, you're not doing it's it. Not right. an Instagram it's video. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, just everyday movements. I think right. that's probably the biggest thing because, you know, you can, you can practice your vacuums every day. You can do these, these, these exercises every day. But you do that for what, an hour a day? You got another 23 hours in that day where you're not doing anything. You know, it's true. Mm-hmm. It's true. When I'm sitting in the car, I'm always doing Kegel work, like mm-hmm. belly button to spine, and Kegels like I bet the Drew loves that too. The flow of urine, like so. You know, sit up nice and tall in your car. <laughs> just and saying. You're, 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 oh, it's an added benefit. You just got really pink all of a sudden. <laughs> it's an added benefit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because we had a conversation about this a few days ago. We were <laughs> first commented. We were like, I'm trying. I'm <laughs> it's super tight. Like, working on my core control. <laughs> I'm working on my pelvic floor therapy. <laughs> What's he's not here? I'm working on my core control. <laughs> I'm just, I'm laughing. Well, hey, you have to make him watch this portion of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So see, there are benefits. I was going to say, I need to to watch the podcast now. (laughs) There is. And as anything in bodybuilding, it's not just about the stage. Like, you know, we're doing this from a whole health perspective or it should be be from a whole health perspective. Like it can actually really help you physically and, you know, intimacy wise, but also just physically help you, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's, it's important to take that stuff seriously. And like I said, like, it's not just about yes. how you look on stage. It's about how you perform in your daily life in all sorts of aspects. <laughs> <laughs> on and off the stage. Well, for some people that's on stage too, but you know, whatever, I mean, whatever floats your boat. Um, <laughs> okay. So next, next question. Um, what is a carb cycle? That's a really basic one. What is a carb cycle? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. What is a carb cycle? Okay. So uh, carb cycling. So carb cycling can be for reasons, you know, different reasons. I utilize carb cycling to push food higher on certain training days. If I'm trying to, you know, stimulate a a certain muscle group to grow. So for example, let's say that somebody really needs to grow their glutes. So maybe two days a week, I'll give them a higher carbohydrates. And then on the other days of the week, I give them lower carbohydrates. So I'm just trying to give them a little bit more of a caloric, caloric surplus to push some food on those training days. The uh, pre and post workout of those of those days are very, very specific. Um, and it's just to give them a little bit more en- energy, a little bit more food towards those sessions. We could also use carb cycling in a prep. Um, This can help kind of stimulate the metabolism as well. So you do like five lower days or dig days Mm -hmm. to higher days, which will help kind of give that metabolism a little bit more of a spark um, to be able to, you know, process food at a higher rate, but also mental mental as well. You know, some people in prep just need like those two higher days a week. That way they can do those, you know, five lower days and, and really dig. So those are yep. the two. Um, do you, do you two use it at all when you're in off season season or just And that's kind of what that looks like. Yeah, 
Yeah, I use it in off season for the first option of like just trying to get food up a little bit higher, really to push muscle hypertrophy on certain body parts. You know, mm-hmm. if I if they need muscle all over, maybe I do it on one upper body day, one lower body day. If they need, you know, mostly glutes, I'm putting that on their, you know, their lower okay. body days. Um, you know, for yep. some people, they won't take a free meal. So they want something very structured. So I'll give them, you know, a high day on a rest day, but it's their mm-hmm. on track meal day yep. where they just get yeah, and I, food. So I tend to keep things of, pretty steady you know, like for my clients and stuff during on an off season. Um, off season, you know, because typically they're eating a lot anyway. So like you said, if you need to utilize it to give them some more on the days where they need to grow a little bit more, that kind of thing, cool. But in general, I usually save that as a tool in our tool box to use for the metabolic purposes once we get into prep. So then that way it just works a little bit. It works a little bit more effectively. I think once you get into prep, if you use it, use it at that point. Um, <clears throat> something that I've incorporated that I actually has been really well received with my clients when they're in off season, it's not really a carb cycle. It's a flex meal. And I use that only when they are on their cycle, because what I find is these girls have intense cravings and they go way off, way off their macros when they get on their cycle. We were just talking about this with cravings and stuff like that. So what I do is I tell them, listen, when you're in off season, when you're in improvement season, you have a flex meal of 500 calories. So you can use that during your cycle time to help calm your craving. So what that means is, is that that 500 calories, you're not going over your macros. You're staying within your macro, your, your calories, you're staying within your calories, but you can eat whatever you want for that 500 calories, meaning it doesn't have to be specifically carbs or fat or whatever. So that way you're not binging over top of what you're supposed to be eating, but you're eating what you want to eat in order to calm the cravings that you have from your hormone spikes. So I've found that has worked very, very well um, with the ladies. And I tell them, listen, this is in your plan. So you can use it or you don't have to. Just let me know if you do it. If you do it, just let me know. If you don't, that's cool too. It's fine. But then that way they feel like if they need Correct. to do something, like if they're just having a really hard time with cal- with calming those, those hormones down and things like that, they have the option to. So yeah, it's worked out great. And then once they go into prep, I take that away. So that's just a, that's just, um, you know, an additional thing that I've kind of put and incorporate it into each one mm-hmm. of those uh, plans that need it. Because I, 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 again, you know, we take this uh, core to feedback too, because again, we take those weekly check-ins and, and what they're saying and how they're feeling and stuff like that. So listen, I can tell you're, you're having a hard time with, with your hunger right now. Go have some chocolate. You know what I mean? <laughs> like whatever, whatever you might need to do. And then again, that keeps them so they don't go and binge, but then yeah. they get satisfied with what they actually want, you know? So it's just a little additional thing that I've, I've started doing. Um, let's do yeah. one more question if I can find a good one here. Yeah. Uh, do, do, do. So we can leave it with this. Um, this is a really broad question, but best advice to give a new competitor. What's one piece of advice that you give somebody that's brand new to the sport? Mm. Yeah. Just take your time. There's no rush, you know, and I know that a lot of people, you know, find the sport and they're super excited and they want to get on stage tomorrow. But, you know, there's so many things you have to consider. First one being, can you afford a decent coach? Because truly the coach makes or breaks your experience, but also your health. You know, is someone really in your corner that really understands the health aspects behind the sport and how to put you in the best position possible to be able to continue the sport, you know, we want longevity. We don't want just to, you know, put all of our eggs into a basket for one show, which your first show is never going to probably be your best show. You know, it's very, very hard for that. So I would just say, take Mm -hmm. your time, save your money. This is not a poor man's sport. If you're coming and pinching and diming, you know, if the athlete start in all these like reddits and, um, you know, uh, online forums and the first thing they ask is, well, how much is this going to cost? That's not the first, that's not the best first question. Um, you really need to be financially sound because again, this is a Mm -hmm. very, very expensive sport, just like competitive cheerleading and, you know, all these other sports, this one is just the same. There's travel fees and you can't, you cannot cut corners. So taking time is the umbrella of all the, the things underneath yeah. it that if you just take your and just time to, again, to pay you back off of that, and I'll give my, much, my much two cents for advice too. But job. like the, the first thing that I tell people when they are starting to get into this is you have to realize this is an investment in your health. This is an investment in your competitive career. It's an investment. Think of it that way versus a cost. You know, there's, those are two different ways to couch this. And yeah, if you look at something as an expense, 
Yeah. You're going to dread paying for it every month. You know what I mean? But if you look at it as, okay, I'm investing in my long-term health and I'm investing in my career as an athlete, I'm investing in what I want to achieve in the years to come, then it becomes a little bit different. This investment is going into creating what you want down in the future, just like anything else. When you, you know, when you're investing in your home and when you're investing in anything, you're investing in yourself, I love you're investing that. in a better future. Okay. So think if you just, just change that terminology around, change that mindset. That. So yeah. agree with you on, on, um, taking your time for sure. Um, and I would say on that same vein, be a good student. So this is a hard one to quantify because there's a lot of information out there that's wrong, but always be curious, always be asking questions, always be trying to find and research things. There's so much stuff on the internet today that you can go look through. And I would say, try to get familiar with the people in the sport that are doing a good job, you know, that are good at what they do. That doesn't necessarily mean get familiar mm. with the athletes because just because they're athletes doesn't mean they know how to coach and doesn't mean they know how to diet and train you. So those things don't go together all the time, you know? So understand that people have different um, specialties, right? So follow the athlete for the inspiration and the motivation and all of that. Follow the coaches for the information, right? So, you know, those are, those are the kinds of things that you should be looking at yeah. as a new competitor, That's great. That's right? A good one. And again, I, I understand wanting to follow the, the, the top athletes in our sport, the girls that are placing top five at the, in the Olympia, fantastic to follow them. But don't take what they say when it comes to training to heart because not all of them, because most of them are not coaches. You know, most of them don't have a background in this other than they just execute, right? So it's the same thing you look at in any sport, right? I always go back to the football. Like you would never go to a quarterback of a team to ask them to be a head coach of the team. They, they're a quarterback. That's what they do. They're a quarterback. Correct. Yes. It's the same thing here. Just because they're great at getting on stage, just because they're great at posing, yeah. doesn't mean they're going to teach yeah. you how to pose. You know, just because they're great at executing exercises doesn't mean they can teach you how to do that. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, vice versa is, is true as well. They may be great at teaching how to pose. One of the best teachers yeah. in posing in our sport is Kenny Wallach. And he doesn't get on stage in a bikini and heels. <laughs> he's an old dude, you know, like he doesn't, he doesn't do it. And he's one of the best teachers, one of the best posing coaches in our sport and has been from, the, from yeah. the jump. You know what I mean? So you have to remember those kinds of things. Get your information, be a good, stu good student, but also know who you're learning from. So... So that would be my two cents as a new competitor. And stop asking yeah, all these questions on, on like Facebook and Reddit boards where people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> There's so much wrong information. There's so much wrong information, right? There's so much Ask misinformation them. out there. Yeah. And it's confusing and I get it, but you have to consider the source. If you're putting into a question into a, mm -hmm. a online forum, you're going to get a yep. lot of different responses. And, I, and, and I'm a kind of cynic of in that regard too, because I think, I think so, they're telling me the wrong yeah, information on good, purpose. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I think that they're trying to sabotage me. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I think, you know? And they could be. They could be out there giving you the wrong information on purpose. So Great point. just, Great just point. keep that in the back of your head. <laughs> and on that note, exactly. we're going to finish out exactly. for today because I have exactly. to go get dry needling done. So pray for me. Because <laughs> hopefully, I'm hoping and praying that when I get this done, my back will feel better. My glute will pop open. I'm hoping all these things. <laughs> I'm like, bring it up it to, the, up to it the Lord. It please, will. please, God, let it work. <laughs> so, uh, but guys, we really appreciate all of your support, all yes. the questions, all the comments, all yes. the love, all the likes, all the subscribes, everything. Because, you know, we're, we've been here for 50 episodes now and we're not slowing down. I, I'm very proud of us for being as consistent as we have been. That's one of the good things about being bodybuilders. We're very consistent about everything. <laughs> well, that's one of the first things you said. You're like, I don't want to commit to this if we're not going to go all in. And we both made a commitment. Yes. Um, you know, I love and appreciate every single person that watches this. We love and appreciate the comments. Like when you guys come up to me at shows and you're like, oh my gosh, I watch the podcast. It's so simple, Absolutely. but it means so much to me. And that is what, you know, keeps motivating us to keep showing up each week. Yep. It's very hard for us to find an hour in our week. I'm just being very honest and transparent with you guys. But 
it means a world of a difference when you guys comment and, and share with us how much you love it. And also we say this all the time, <laughs> ideas, to give us ideas around yeah. our 50th episode. So we need always fresh ideas and things that you guys are, are thinking yes. of, you know, that way we can talk about them. But yes, I just wanted to say thank you to no. you, Sean, as well for giving us that platform. And yeah, I know, yeah right? we're not slowing down yet. So absolutely. And so guys, like, one year. like Jordan was just saying, and let's keep going. Below. Let's keep moving. Tell us, tell us the things you want us to talk about. I mean, obviously things are not off the, off the table for talking about kegels you know <laughs> so like it is what it is so and, <laughs> open books clearly uh <laughs> no and and again open same books thing you said too i love when people come the secrets. Like, this person too like oh I listen to this. like i said when i was on my live last night you know people were saying oh what's the second part of the podcast i was like what are you talking about <laughs> i didn't even know what you meant because <laughs> i know they, they pay attention which is fantastic i think it's great that you guys pay attention to they're invested and you you remember things i don't even remember so you keep keep my head on straight <laughs> no, right <laughs> so thank you again guys like comment toast. and subscribe yeah. <laughs> for episode 50